the, the actual Turkish state is, is quite young. I mean, a lot of people think of the Ottoman Empire and things like that as being ancient, but Turkey in itself has only existed, I think, since about 1912. What we'd like to do is go inland and see another part of Turkey, and particularly some of the ancient sites. And me with family The bond that we share is as deep as the sea No matter how rough things may come to be You and me with family Sing home Hey, long for the ride home Hey, I'll stay by your side home Hey, you'll always be We've left our boat on anchor and we are off to get Gobekli Tepe. So we're going to catch a bus, 16 hours overnight. Um, here we are on the way to the bus station. So from Bodrum we're getting the bus to San or Shanluifa as they say, which is quite far east near the Syrian border. And we're going to go and catch our bus half an hour early for a change. It's a 180 lira single for an adult, um, a little bit less for a child, but it works out around about a um, hundred, just over a hundred pounds for all of us to go one way, so nearly 200 to go two ways. But it's cheaper than flying for us. Flying would be about 45 pounds one way each. The other thing, the bus journey is 16 hours, so we get on it at midday, half 12. Kids are really excited about the bus journey, and um, we'll sleep on the bus and wake up in the morning, and we should be there, hopefully. Yeah, I'm really excited about this bus journey. I really like traveling on buses. It's the way that I used to do it back in the day when I was traveling, when I was younger. And you just get to sit on the bus, you get to look at the scenery, you get a good book, and um, yeah, it's a good way to travel. So you don't get the true impression of Turkey just by visiting one side or the other. We've, we've just been down the West Coast and seen it, and it's very European, very liberal. The, the marinas are very up to Western standards, uh, and prices are probably up to Western standards as well. Yes, as you can see, it's the... Um Squat toilet, I'm never really sure which way to face. It's very cramped. Well, I'm kind of aching all over from staying in one position. Very, very, very achy. The engine's roaring, it's like our boat, the, um, everything just is shuddering. And Nobody's actually sleeping, apart from you and they're all very upright and very tired. So this is one of the stops in the bus. Um, I'm unbelievably tired, except it doesn't change me from being hungry. So this is some kind of chicken soup. Um, it's really nice. Um, there's, uh, there's a soup at the top. And then when, um, if you dig your food in, you get the rice and chicken. And it's, all, um, it's the best with bread. And on the house, I think, uh, they also gave us um, some uh, Turkish tea. And I really want to try, try it. When I was in my 20s, uh, I did a lot of trips around Asia, around Nepal and India. So I was kind of, I was really expecting kind of goats and chickens and things like that. Uh, which was really disingenuous to the Turks because we're probably on the cleanest coach I've ever been in in my life. This is the last stop before we actually get to San Lurfa. Um, and it's probably about as close to a conflict zone as we ever want to get because 20 miles in that direction is Syria and a couple of hundred miles in that direction is Iraq and Iran. So we're, we're kind of right in the middle of it here. So another hour's driving me in San Lurfa. Um, the bus journey is, was supposed to be 16 hours, but it's taken more like 20 hours, I think, so it's been a long old journey. The kids have held up pretty well. Um, the bus is full of families, but the kids have been remarkably quiet. I mean, I've never been on a bus journey where kids have been so well behaved and quiet. It's unbelievable. The guy with the gun has just taken our passports, as well as everyone's ID cards. They're going for a hotel. We're here in the Manitsi Hotel in Shandurfa. Um, I organised it through Booking.com. We kind of got the best deal we could really, which was quite a lot. I was surprised actually for this part of Turkey, but it was 100 and 
40 for two rooms. Yeah, it was good, breakfast was good, and it's a nice place, it's a nice feel. It's right near all the main sites in Shanlufa, and it's also really close to the main bazaar, which is where we're going now. So yeah, it's a good location. <laughs> Decided, I'm just going to wear a scarf like every other lady here and I actually found that people don't stare as much and I've kind of blended in and I quite like it. <laughs> So this is bizarre. It's uh, reputed to be one of the um, most authentic bazaars left in Turkey, and it really is just a rabbit warren of all sorts of different things. And each street kind of is selling different things like jewellery, uh, tobacco, uh, woodwork. This is the woodwork section, obviously. <laughs> Okay, this guy is the pop maker. He's either repairing or making new ones. Pretty cool. Well, it's really hot, so we've come to the cafe and I thought I'd try something different I've never tried before. So I've ordered some salgam soya, which is fermented black carrot juice. Black carrot, salt, boiled and pounded wheat, turnip and preservatives. Well, it smells like rotten cheeseburgers. It tastes like carrot, but just covered in a lot of salt with a bit of like juice in it. Does, and does it with taste? And um, with ants poo on it. <laughs> just walked through the gun and knife section um, and I wanted to film it but the guys looked so shifty I, I didn't dare do it but they've got semi-automatic rifles, knives, pistols, everything you could ever want to start a war with. Um, it's a bit scary actually walking through that bit but we'll carry on to the, uh, the jewellery section. Now I know where they get the pigeons from in that restaurant. They're over there. They grow things for pets. Shamlufa is quite a big city, as you can see, and there's a lot of mosques around it. Okay, so this is the pool of the sacred fish. So apparently um, King Nimrod, who lived in the area, he threw Abraham into a fire because Abraham, not only did he try and steal his daughter, and you know, his daughter's love, but also he sort of um, threatened war against King Nimrod. So King Nimrod threw him into this fire and um, they say that this, the fire, the flames of the fire turn into the water of this pool and then the burning logs turn into the carp. So it's all very sacred, you can't swim here, um, but you can feed the fish because they're very sacred. There's thousands of them. The kids are really enjoying feeding them actually. 
Pepper and there's sacred carpfish. Sacred means. Sacred means you can't kill them. If you kill them, you go blind. cave where Abraham was born. Before you go in to see it, you can wash um, and make sure yourself you're completely cleansed and then you go in and it's a separate entrance for male and female. You take your shoes off and we have to wear a scarf and the cave, well apparently when Nimrod heard from a prophet that Abraham was going to be born and he was going to be a threat to his kingdom, he wanted to kill him but he couldn't find him, so what he did is he ordered that all children were killed. Now, Abraham's mum knew that this was going on, so she went to have Abraham in a cave, and she apparently went in there and suckled him every night, and he stayed there until he was 15 years old, and then he came out, so that was really for the safety of him. But it's a sacred place, and everyone goes there. It's a big pilgrimage to go to this cave where Abraham was born. We've been to the sacred pond. We cooled off a bit there, and it was nice, nice under the trees. And now we're kind of heading up to the archaeological museum because um, it's apparently better. There's a lot of information here about Gobekli Tepe. And um, if we come here first, we can do some research. And then tomorrow we'll be like more informed and we'll enjoy it more, hopefully. But it is going to be very hot tomorrow when we go to the actual site. We're at the Sandler for Archaeological Museum. What are you looking forward to most? Air what? No, but I mean in the museum. Air conditioning. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having a cold shower back in there. I mean, no, I mean, I am very excited to go inside the museum and find history all around. Fake news. We're at the San Luofa Archaeological Museum. Tickets are 14 lira each, which is about two pounds. Uh, Ewan goes free. Yay, sorry. Always for free. <laughs> this is the oldest monument I've seen in my life. And some of these different tools were found in Gebeki Tepe. That's a woman from Gebeki Tepe. It's an effective way of like conserving stuff. Imagine using your relatives. So from our hotel we got on the 63 bus, which is like a sort of shuttle bus and it brings you to this main bus station. And then here we knew we had to try and find the 100 bus. We did find this bus with Gobekli Tepe written on it. And um, he said he's going there and it only cost us 10 lira for all of us. So that was really strange. I thought it was going to be 10 each or something. We hope we're going to the right place. There's no one else going. Amazing is there's all this really modern infrastructure here, and there's literally nobody around. I mean, we've been to the Parthenon, we've been to Delphi, and it's just packed with tourists. And here, there's nobody. 20 or 30 miles in that direction, there's a Syrian border, so I guess that scares a lot of Westerners off. Um, you see a few locals kind of um, visiting the museums, but other than that, we've got the place to ourselves. It's amazing. Tickets were 36 lira just to go to the site or 42 lira if you wanted to go to the new visitor centre, which is really worth it. In the visitor centre you can watch a historical documentary and they even have a 3D cinema experience to get you in the mood.
shuttle, the, the actual site is two kilometres away from the visitor centre, so we didn't realise that, so now we're on another bus going further up into the hills. So it's amazing to think that this was all built by hunter-gatherers. I mean, there's a lot of sophisticated building techniques that have gone into this for people who, who weren't supposed to know anything about farming. This is the oldest monument I've ever seen in my whole life. It's double the age of Stonehenge. Did they find it somewhere else and then get the up and then put it here or did they find it and build something around? A farmer came along and he saw the top of a stone and he thought, oh, what's that? And he brushed it away. And he well, that's interesting. And then he got a scientist to come along, an archaeologist, and they went, that is interesting. And then they, they started to peel away the layers and eventually they dug down and down and they found all of this. And this is only a very, very small part of the whole thing. There are temples and stones in these fields all around here, like just like this. So he just saw like a tiny bit? Tiny bit at the top, yeah. Um, ants started farming before this was made, so ants. technically ants are more advanced than humans. How did he know it was something? Well, I think he saw a carving on it, like a, an animal carving, and he went to get the archaeologist, and the archaeologist, the archaeologist came along. And he said, that is very interesting, we're going to start digging here. We made friends with Tadic, who was the grandson of the farmer who founded Beke Tepe. My name is Tariq. Tariq. Tariq, like this. Okay. This is my family's team. And uh, first, my grandfather, 1990, no, 1984, is for, uh, found this statue, big statue, beginning a museum. And after uh, Klaus Schmidt, 1994, coming, uh, start digging. So when his granddad found the Blake Tepe, um, the whole village helped excavate it. Wow, Very your brothers big. and your uncles and aunts. Yes, my cousin, my and cousin. And so, do you help with the excavation? Yeah, I, every time. Yeah. So this I'm 15 years working. And while he was excavating, he also learned how to be a sculptor, and that's why he made this. So, this was made at the end of Paleolithic time, because Paleolithic time was when. Um, when they were hunting, but they weren't farming yet, and then Neolithic is when they started farming. Neolithic times, there was pottery and there was pre-pottery. So pottery is when they started making like utensils and stuff, and pre-pottery is when they didn't have that. This was made in the pre-pottery time, so they didn't have like anything to make it with, so it's really cool how they've just made it with stones, really. So, um, the initial discovery was 1963, um, but the real significance wasn't really um, realised until about 19, 1995, I think it was, um, when they started excavating uh, the year after and they really found what, what the whole place was about. And then they did some uh, geological radar surveys and they found that there was about 20 sites like this covering the whole, uh, like the whole area around here. So it's, it's a massive site. I think they've only excavated so far roughly about 5% of the site. Uh, it is truly massive and this is in a time where before farming was even uh, discovered or before Neolithic man even started farming. So it's an amazing feat thinking that this was actually built by cavemen. Really. You, they actually started burying their dead and like sacrificing their dead instead of just like chucking it into a pit. So this might be one of the reasons it was made, maybe like to sacrifice the dead or to like if maybe they had an afterlife. So there are two types of pillars. The bigger ones are shaped like a human and the smaller ones have animal carving on, carvings on it. So people think that the ones shaped like humans were for the human gods, and the ones with animal carvings on it, on it was for like to pray to the animals. This is like a bull with its head to the side with the two um, horns, and just below, I think that's a crane. Yeah. I think the amazing thing is, is it shows that they had the um, the wherewithal and the knowledge to to build quite complicated structures and yet they choose not to kind of build any domesticated buildings at this time and they chose to move around. I mean that might have been because they were following their animal herds and they hadn't actually domesticated animals yet. But the other interesting thing is um, from a design perspective it doesn't really make any sense because the interior ring is inaccessible. Oh, well it's only accessible from the top so the only way they could have got in there was by getting a ladder down into the middle. Um, why wouldn't you create access for somebody to get 
in the middle bit. Mysteries on top of mysteries, on top of enigmas, on top of um, questions and questions. And I think that the further in, the further that they dig down, the more questions um, come up about this place. It's just none of it really makes any sense, um, and that's what makes it so intriguing. I think. So some people have, you know, questioned why they've built Gobekli Tepe here. Um, some people think that it's because the quality of the stone was good. There was, you know, they quarried it here and, and you couldn't find that stone everywhere for those pillars. You couldn't find that good quality stone, so they maybe found that here. And the other reason was that it's quite high up um, and it would be visible from quite far and wide. So the other theory is that they built it here up on this hill so that people, other sort of hunter-gatherer groups would be able to see it and they could come here and meet. Yeah, if you look over there, I think just on that plateau over there, I think that's the Syrian border. So yeah, it's not very far away from there. And the town of Shanlufa is kind of down that way, sort of as you get more of the farming area. <laughs> Can we sit with the soldiers? So after a cold drink, we went to find our local bus back to town. Okay, so we're on our way back now to Shanlufa, to the town. We're on the little local bus number zero, which runs back to the town. And we're going to all the, land, the farming land. So we can see everybody out still picking tomatoes in this heat, um, in their little roadside shelters. It's so hot that you can't understand how they managed to grow so many tomatoes. But there is a good irrigation system going on. Um, we've got this fantastic dam and also um, like in between these fields there's various irrigation channels and canals. Um, but yeah, they put it all sorted. So we just got back from our long bus journey and back to Bodrum. And now we're sitting here trying to work out how to get to our boat because we got a lift to shore, didn't we, on our boat? Yeah. Woody's gone off and he's trying to find out how he can get, get a lift with someone actually. He's gone off with some random guy to try and get a lift to the boat. Mwah. So we're waiting. Hey. What do you think of the bus journey? Fun! Fun! Today! And what do you think of Quebec Tepe? Boring! Boring? No way! It had been a long, tiring trip, but we all learnt something that we would remember. We're actually doing the people. This is God bless Kate today. Years are carrying blocks to build it. He's cooking a snake. That's an animal, but they haven't had elephants. There's their animals. Um, there's a kid holding a bucket bucket to get rainwater. We're lucky we got back from Shanlufra today because to be quite honest this wind had just picked up and our anchor just dragged onto um, that massive gullet behind us with a huge bow spread. So that's all we've got time for this episode but please tune in for the next episode to find out the full story of what happened when our anchor dragged. This is the Gobleke Tepe um, expedition. Exhibition. Expedition. Exhibition. Exhibition. Thank you. I've been expecting this. We need to make Goblete, Goblete, um, Goblete. Can you say it, Dad? as deep as the sea no matter how rough things may come to be you and me we're family sing home so this is a really big thank you to our patrons for 
pledging to Mothership Adrift and supporting us on our journey as we travel around the world. This allows us to make stories and then share these stories with you. If you want to become a patron, it's really easy. Click on the patron button and join our family in this journey around the world. And if you want to do it, do it.